All right, welcome back to the Wild West Tennis Podcast. Today, I am joined by Vanash Vermani, who is the co-host of Tennis and Bagels. He's been an enthusiastic tennis fan since he first saw the epic 2008 Wimbledon final between Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal, a match that most people consider the greatest of all time. And on that note, uh, a man that does consider that the greatest match of all time, Steve Flake, who wrote about that in his uh, second book about the greatest matches of all time, mentioned that final as the greatest match he'd ever seen. And this is why I really wanted this young man to come on. Steve is a guest of yours on Tennis and Bagels after every major. Is that correct, Vinash? Yeah. Hi there, Bradley. Uh, you know, it was a pleasure to connect with you, and I'm really honored to be on this show. Uh, that is correct. Yes, Steve Flink uh, has been a guest that comes on Tennis and Bagels after every major uh, since the 2020 U.S. Open. So we've gotten a chance to do quite a bit of shows together, and I obviously appreciate his time and his knowledge, and he's probably the best uh, I've ever seen in the business when it comes to analyzing the sport. So, Boy, there's no holes in his game. I mean, who would you compare Steve Flink to in the big three? Uh, I would say he's the most complete of, you know, he's the most complete uh, analyst I've ever seen. So based on that, I would say he's like, you know, Novak Djokovic because he's a little bit sort of underappreciated. And in the sense he is, uh, you know, and I know he's a, he's a big Djokovic admirer as well. And rightfully so, because I see a lot of the same qualities between the two. You nailed it. You nailed it. That was, that was the best answer anyone could have given in the same I would have said as well. Uh, although he does have the class. Uh, Federer with his attire and the tenacity of Rafa. So he, he incorporates all the big three, but I think you got him right with Djokovic. Speaking of which, that leads us into what I'd like to start off with is the uh, ATP year in championship just ended with Novak taking home the title for a record. Was it six times? Yep, record, six. Equaling, record equaling sixth. Uh, so he tied Roger Federer there. There you go. So, as you know, we like to focus on the, the U.S. players there. If we could, let's start off with, uh, on day one, what you thought of Taylor Fritz's uh, match against Rafael Nadal. Yeah, uh, so obviously I've been following Taylor for, uh, you know, ever since he broke out on the scene. Um, he's from San Diego, and uh, I always, you know, so because of that, I have sort of a natural soft spot for him. Uh, my uh, former tennis coach actually coached him. so. I've uh, been waiting for this breakthrough for quite quite some time, and I would say since October of last year at Indian Wells in the autumn, he's been a different player, and he's really sort of risen from that tw top 20 to 25 to like really putting himself in the mix in the top eight, and he really solidified, uh, I would say really justified him uh, you, you know, qualifying for this event, not only qualifying, but later making the semis and pushing Djokovic. So I, I expected him to you know ha have a really good chance at beating Nadal, especially in these conditions, indoor hard courts, you know, second half of the season, Nadal has struggled since Wimbledon, uh, you know, came into the event having just lost to Tommy Paul, having lost to Francis Tiafoe at the U.S. Open, uh, you know, some personal stuff going on as well, you know, becoming a father. So all of those elements combined, I thought Fritz really stepped up um, on the day and it was a tight mm -hmm. fought first set. Um, I actually thought Rafa was hanging in there quite well and it went to a first set tie break and I think uh, Rafa double faulted on the first point, and that's when I sort of knew that okay, this is Fritz's time. He's got to step up here and take advantage of this mini break being handed to him. And to his credit, you know, he absolutely didn't look back from then on and just tore through the second set. Um, Nadal, obviously, some frustrating misses for him, uh, and I think he would have liked to keep that set to one break. And I know he said after the match that it's particularly the second break that he was very disappointed with. And um, you know, I thought I thought it was a really good showing for Fritz to you know. To, to get that win because obviously, you know, there were some chances for him at Wimbledon in the quarterfinals with uh, Nadal suffering from that app tear. I remember mm -hmm. the people in this corner telling him, you got to stop, you know, you got to, this isn't worth it anymore. And he ended up finishing the yeah. match and showing what a great warrior he is and had to eventually pull out of the semis against Kyrgios. But uh, there was a little bit of, uh, there was definitely some sentiment around in tennis that, you know, Fritz, that Nadal was there for the taking and Fritz with a little bit more experience certainly could, could have pulled off that victory. So it was nice to see him, you know, sort of solidify himself as one of the best. And yeah, he was very impressive. Boy, that is a great recap. Very Steve Link-esque 
in your, uh, you know, summary of like even getting to the fact that the start of the second set, you know, of, of that match in, uh, in Turin, like that, that, I felt like I was talking to Steve for a second there. But I, I'd like to take a, a step back because you have followed him so closely, being that you, know, you mentioned San Diego. Uh, talk a little bit about the win he had over Rafa in Indian Wells because that's, that's important. And, you know, it, it maybe gave him the confidence to know he knew how to play this all-time great. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the awesome things about Fritz – um, you know, that you'd like to see in an up-and-coming, you know, I mean, not up-and-coming in his case because he's quite established now and he's 25 years of age. But mm -hmm. he does not fear the big boys. When he steps out on the court against Federer and Nadal or Djokovic, he believes he can beat them. And you can see that in the way he strikes the ball, his conviction, you know, such a solid player off of both wings. I think he's really improved his fitness. He has Mike Russell in his corner now. Um, and Paul Anacone has been working with him. Paul Anacone wouldn't waste his time with someone who he didn't think had the kind of talent and repertoire to challenge these big boys. And you know, he he really. I, I think leading into the into the Nadal match, he was feeling quite confident about his chances. But actually, what happened is he rolled his ankle in the practice just before Indian yes, Wells. That's right. Yes. And so you know, there was some suspicion about whether or not he was even going to step on the court against Nadal, let alone take him out. Uh, so for him mm -hmm. to, uh, but I, I think actually when the match started happening, you noticed that Nadal was struggling. Was the one struggling a little bit more? Of course, he had that grueling match against Alcaraz the day before, and he's been on this amazing twenty match win streak. Yes. And, uh, so you could see really that Aptir was bothering him, but nonetheless, it took a hell of a player to beat him, especially in the second set um, of that final, in the biggest match of his of Taylor's career. I think it had helped him having played well in Indian Wells before. I think he really loves those conditions with the high bounce. Mm -hmm. Him being six foot five, he takes the ball extremely early. And what I look for against Nadal is a player who has a strong two-handed backhand, who can really challenge Nadal's defense and take his time away. And I feel like those conditions are tailor-made for Taylor. Huh, funny, no pun intended there. But um, <laughs> <laughs> he's able to take the ball on the rise with his backhand and really drive it cross mm -hmm. court, and it's really flat. And then he's able to hit it through the court so well, and he rushes Nadal on his forehand wing. And uh, you know, on, even on a court like Indian Wells, where you would think Nadal would have the time to take that ball down the line and uh, and sort of change that cross court pattern, just you know, physically was lacking that little bit, little bit extra. Obviously, not a hundred percent. And Taylor really closed it out yeah. because. Um, you know, if that match goes to a third set, that's still anyone's game. And especially with the confidence that Nadal had from the beginning of the year, this best ever start in, the, in his career, which is quite incredible at his age. So I think that, no, I think right. to answer your, to go back to your question, that win was extremely important for him. Just knowing he can win yeah. a big title, knowing he can beat Nadal, having done it before. I think it really gave him the confidence this time around at the end of the year. Well, yeah, you said it, you said it best because he had lost the match the, the whole year on hard court. And, um, it was a, a, you know, a gritty, gutsy effort from Taylor. And then the next time they play, if I'm not, mis not mistaken, is at Wimbledon in the quarterfinals. And uh, Nadal barely edges them out in five. What, you know, that's quite a different surface from that slow, sticky Indian Wells court. And for Taylor to almost knock him out in uh, five sets, what were your thoughts uh, looking back on that match? Yeah, um, you know, I, to be honest, in that match, it, you know, N Nadal, I had really have to give it to him. He played a fantastic fifth set tiebreak. Uh, he knew that he was compromised, and so he had to finish points a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. He had to go with his down-the-line forehand earlier in rallies. And, you know, him having played so many five-set matches in his career, having a, you know, having the confidence of having won five-setters throughout the whole year, especially at Roland Garros Senate and at the Australian Open, I think he was able to actually expose yeah. some of the weaknesses that Taylor still has in his game to go from, you know, let's say being an eight, number eight in the world to being top four. Uh, and so, you know, Nadal was able to mm -hmm. mix, in, mix it in with a slice backhand and uh, bring Taylor forward at net, which is not something he's super comfortable. Uh, you know, he plays super big. He's a power baseliner from both wings, and he has a fantastic serve. I always compare his serve to mm -hmm. Pete Sampras, just the fluidity of it, the simplicity in his motion, how repeatable it is that, ball toss that he can hit, you know, he seems to be able to hit every serve with that same toss. So I think he has that kind of serenity about him as well on yeah. the serve. And, you know, that's what kept that match so tight and darn close. But I wouldn't really, I didn't really have much critique for, for Taylor other than, you know, he just needs to put himself in situations like that more often because, you know, prior to this year, he hadn't made a fourth round of a major. His first fourth round of a major was at the Australian mm -hmm. Open. When he, and, you know, yeah, that's, that's the, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and that's the question that I uh, I like to ask people 
especially uh, an expert like yourself on Taylor Fritz, having been such a keen observer of his game uh, in Southern California and throughout now his pro career as well. Uh, what are your expectations for Fritz uh, next year? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I think you know when you're 25 and sort of hitting to you know your your mid 30s and you're established that he is. I think um, the pressure is really on now because he's had such a fantastic year. He's won a title now at 250, 500, and thousand level, and he's made a major quarterfinal. And you know, mm -hmm. I think had it not been for injuries, he might have possibly even ranked higher, been ranked higher. We don't know that for sure, but um, I think he's feeling pretty good about where he's at physically. I just uh, you know, ho hopefully he has a he has a good off season where he's able to because he's playing the Davis Cup. So automatically that means he only has four or five weeks left to really train. But I think now it's between the ears for him. It's it's all about mentally, can he handle the big moments? Next time he's up two sets to one in a major quarterfinal or in a fourth round, how does he mm -hmm. handle that situation? I think, he, you know, yeah. having had so many wins and best of three this year against the top 10 players, showing him that he really belongs. Uh, I think the only next, the next step for him is to be top five uh, and possibly, uh, yeah, you know, go one round better at Wimbledon. I actually really like his game on grass, just with the big serve and his aggressive ball striking off both wings. He he tends to do well there at, at Wimbledon, and that's a big bonus because not many guys in his age group are, you know, fantastic on grass and they don't have that kind of confidence on it. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I would say just, just uh, you know, even if he repeats something like what he did this year and just defends as many points as he can, uh, I think it would be a, I think it would be an overall success. And he's going to have a lot of players behind him pushing him as well, you know, with the likes of, Tiafo and Paul, and so I think it's a good time right now in American men's tennis, and he's he's definitely the forefront of it. Yeah, and and, yeah, and who better as a coach than Paul Anacone to help him to uh, you know on with the grass court game? Uh, I don't know if you got to watch Anacone much. Maybe you've seen you know tapes, but if you know, know about his resume as a player, that he was a chip yeah. and charge kind of guy. He knew yeah. how to come in. And it sounds like if you're saying maybe, and that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, if Fritz, uh, you know, if he steps up the transition game, yeah, and can can get end points earlier, coming in, that, that's an area he can improve on. Uh, you already said his serve reminds you of Pete Sampras, so that that sounds like it's pretty locked in. Ground strokes, you're a big fan of, but boy, if he if he tightened up his net game a little, wouldn't that pay dividends, especially on the grass? Yeah, it would be massive, and that's kind of the the the, the one step I I think that's remaining in his game, the transition game, and just being more confident and not so awkward when he's up at the net, and just you know knowing when to split step. I mean, he's played some doubles with the likes of Kyrgios and other good, uh, you know, good players who have good hands and feels. So, uh, you know, just working on that, finding that part of his game. I think uh, he's such a tall guy, so when he's uh, being forced to hit shots sort of below his knees and come in on come in on some awkward shots, that's when, you know, the really best players in the world can maybe uh, have that slight edge over him in some of these longer baseline rallies. But I think he's ex he's improved his movement, which is really big, you know, explosive movement overall. Uh, he seems to have gotten fitter and stronger, and that I think that's credit to Mike Russell on his team. They've really worked on that, especially in, in, in the offseason before this year. So I think that that really is, to answer your question, I think that is really the main piece missing, just, just mental being able to close out the big matches and the transition game and the volleys at net. I, I haven't seen him go to the backhand slice a whole lot. So that that is maybe one up one thing in his arsenal that if he were to have that along with, I think it just goes back to the touch and feel. And if your backhand volley is very good and your slice is very good, I think you know those two kind of go hand in hand a little bit technique wise. So I, I think but in terms yeah. of forehand backhand serve movement, he's got the foundation. Yeah, wow. That is that's great assessment. So let's Let's move on to the to the man that he, um, you know, I think he's a little bit older than Felix. Um, I mean, they they turned pro, I think, uh, not too far apart. Um, you know, and they had a they had a match that that Taylor he knocked him off, I believe. Am I am I remembering that correct? That Taylor beat Felix in uh, Turin. Yep, that was the so that that match was actually big because that was the winner of that was going to get to the semis. Because they'd both beaten, they'd both beaten Rafa. They'd both lost to Casper Ruud. So it was essentially uh, like a okay. final of an event. So it was, yeah, winner takes all. And Fritz ended up getting the better of Felix there, six two in the in the third. And there really wasn't much separating both of them. Of course, you know they split the first two sets in tie breaks. It was a very much a serve dominated type match. Uh, neither mm -hmm. player really had many looks. I think Felix had some looks in the second set in the very beginning, and a couple three break points to go up to love. 
uh, didn't really take them. I thought Taylor did such a good job in that match of managing the backhand to backhand rallies. Just knowing that his backhand is better than Felix's right now, it's just more solid technically. He takes it a little bit earlier. He can hit it through these low bouncing courts. Uh, it's a little bit more effective. And f uh, I think Felix tends to spray a little bit or shank a little bit sometimes on the backhand. And I think Taylor knew that going in. And I was a little bit surprised by how quickly it unraveled for Felix in the third set. Uh, just would have probably expected him to get out of this group. I think when I was making my predictions, I definitely thought Felix and Fritz would come out of this group, but nothing to take away from Felix as well because he had an amazing indoor season, having won three titles and getting to the Paris Bercy finals. And maybe, you know, some fatigue kicked in there at the end of that third set fatigue, combination of fatigue and nerves and strong play from Fritz. So I think, uh, yeah. yeah, that was a big step forward actually for Fritz. And now he's beaten Felix twice because they also played in the ATP Cup. And I'm really fascinated if they play again this week at the at the Davis Cup with everything that's on the line for both Canada and the U.S. But we're going to get to that a little bit later. Uh, and so let's let's uh, let's hold that for a second. But yeah, I uh, I think your assessment is is spot on. I mean, these guys. Um, oh, what the heck? I mean, let's 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 talk about their rivalry and what what is next for them. Let's go ahead. I mean, they're gonna. I I I don't know about you, but I can't see the U.S. losing to Italy, and I can't see Canada losing to Germany, which would mean that uh, those two countries would meet in the sem semifinals of Davis Cup. Is that how you have it? Yeah, I do expect both Canada and the U.S. to come through. I think with um, with the Italy team, uh, they needed to have Yannick Sinner and Matteo Berrettini because sure. those are those would be their best shots right now. I do I do like the way Musetti is playing, and uh, you know he would be their number one right now. I think it's Musetti, and number two is Lorenzo Sonigo. So the two yes. Lorenzos will be carrying the flag for them. Uh, yeah. But but I definitely do expect, uh, you know, the likes of Fritz and Tiafo to win their singles matches there. Uh, so I think not having Sinner and Berrettini is, you know, definitely helps our chances even more in terms of progressing to the semis. And then actually for Germany, um, they don't have Alexander Zverev. So that's definitely uh, some, you know, that's the a big player that they're lacking. But uh, they do have Jan Leonard Struff. And if he does play Denis Shapovalov, then I yeah. think that match is a little bit more 50-50 because I, I know him and Struff have played each other a bunch. I, I want to say eight times, and uh, yeah. Struff has gotten the better of that head-to-head. -head. I think it's 5-3 for Struff. So if they play each other, I'm a little bit, you know, and, and Dennis being the kind of, you know, a little bit of an enigma sometimes when it comes to his performance yeah. on a weekly basis, that could get a little bit interesting. And then I do think if it comes down to the doubles, which if they split, if they split their singles matches, it will. Uh, they do. They have a strong doubles team in Poets and uh, the other players slipping my mind right now. But they're both ex excellent doubles players uh, for a team. They, yeah. No, they're 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 solid there. And I, and I don't know the the format they've changed. I don't know if you've kept up on it. Um, if you have, please fill me in on how it works with the doubles, uh, the format. Because I don't think they play best of five anymore in singles or doubles. No, the best of five is gone. So now it's it's just best of three sets, and I think it's a full set third. So uh -huh. yeah. I think that's the yeah that's the difference, right? Yeah. And and so basically, uh, Germany could uh, yeah they in the doubles they could be sneaky. Uh, yeah. You know, but, but I would still put Canada be... as a favorite. I, I would still put Canada as the favorite just because Struff has sure. not had not had a very solid year, and he is their third yeah. best singles ranked. Players, so there is like uh, Oscar Ote is their number one, and Yannick Hoffman is their number two. So if that if the if that lineup holds up, then I really like Felix and Dennis to come through. Yeah, I do too. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, the the head to head uh, with with uh, him against Chapo is is encouraging, and it, Davis Cup is kind of one of those things where uh, it can get nervy. You know, it, yeah. it's it's a little different than um, your regular ATP competitions. It can get dicey. Um, so it could come down to doubles. I think that would be the only way Germany could get by them. I agree. Would yeah. be they'd have to take the doubles. That's my outside guess. You're right. You're right. That, that's how I feel as well. Uh, but with the U.S., um, you know, with uh, you said Fritz will be there, Tiapo, Jack Sock is going to play doubles. I, I don't know how this – Without Sinner and Berrettini, I don't know how they can fend off the U.S. I mean, is there any scenario where you could see them beating them, beating the U.S.? Um, not that I see right now because, yeah, I mean, they have, I, I guess they have Fonini and Bulelli in the doubles. I mean, they're experienced, but 
for me, mm-hmm. sort of past his prime right now. And uh, you know what? What was a little curious for me is I I was wondering why Rajiv Ram was not in the doubles pairing. Uh, you know, the, he just won the <laughs> three finals, and you know, and I, I guess I guess the answer to that would be I guess Sok can just play with anyone. I mean, Sok is you know a fantastic doubles player, and he he has chemistry with Isner with all the other American players. So I think they feel confident enough. But I think Rajiv Ram was was a little bit uh, left out of this group because he's fantastic. So I'm not sure what went on b- behind that decision. Uh, but I'm sure Captain Marty Fish probably thought it all through. And uh, with Sock on, yeah. on this team, I think we should be fine completely uh, for uh, Italy. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of times that's – that's. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it um, it harkened back to uh, Davis Cup throughout the annals of time. And I think that for a captain uh, – and this goes way back. They, that's a tough assignment. Um because oftentimes it does come down to a difficult decision regarding doubles. Yeah. Uh, you know, for many years, when Patrick McEnroe was the Davis Cup captain for the United States, uh, he went with the Bryan brothers every year. And because it was a guaranteed point. And it was only one time they lost the point was against Croatia in 2005. And that was in the U.S. when we lost to Croatia in uh, Carson, California. Uh, we had Agassi on the team. Roddick and the Bryan brothers and um, <laughs> Yvonne Lubacic didn't lose the match. And, and that includes doubles. Um, right. So it, it, it's really, it's tough. It's a tough job picking that team. And I, I think Patrick McEnroe did the right thing, assigning Agassi and Roddick in singles and the Bryan brothers in doubles, but they got swept <laughs> at home. Yeah. So uh, Marty, he, he I don't think he's answered it. I don't think he's had to do press yet. I think it'll probably happen after the first match. Yeah. I'm sure. I, I kind of think your explanation makes sense. Um, Jack has been playing with these guys for a lot longer maybe than than, than Ram. And uh, it'll go something along those lines. Um, he's in a tough position. Yeah. Uh, because uh, he, he, has to, he has to think about, really, he has to think about winning – uh, now, not not so much in the future. It, it's it's really about now, and <clears throat> I, I'm I'm sure he'll answer that question properly in 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 the at the press conference. But to your point, Jack Sock and just about anybody. I mean, you know, look at Labor Cup. Yeah, he was with Tiafo, right? Yeah, that and Marty will probably say, "Look at look in 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 in, in Labor Cup, uh, Tiafo and Sock beat." The two greatest guys of all time. Yeah. Need I say more? I'm guessing it'll be along those lines, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've seen soccer kill it with everyone in Labor Cup. You know, doesn't matter from Isner yeah. to Tiafo to could be with a could be with any anybody on this bench. I mean, even Tommy Paul. Like they just seem to have that chemistry. And Sock has such wonderful hands at the net, and he has the big forehand, which everyone fears. Even the even when even the volleyer at net. Uh, I mean, it's just. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and he's got the athleticism. Obviously, he's won majors with multiple partners, so there's no, there's absolutely no doubting his skills. And I'm sure he has a good and explanation. Look, and Ram coming off of the ATP Finals, uh, you know, maybe he just didn't feel like this was, you know, this would be the uh, the appropriate kind of setting for it. But I, I, I I'm not sure. But I'm, I, I definitely would trust Marty in terms of his. Oh his yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would trust him as well. And and maybe there's also the point of, okay, let's say. <clears throat> Um, uh, Tiafo or uh, Fritz gets hurt in um, in practice, and they need. Um, well, I guess I mean you know Ron's not going to be able to play singles, but Jack could. Yeah. Jack's a better singles player than than Ron, so you know he could he could justify it in that sense. Well, if, if I had to put him in singles, I can I can use him there, and Definitely. I don't know if there's a fourth player added. I, I don't know what this new format is. Is it just the three of those guys, or did they add a fourth guy? Yeah, I think they're allowed to have five. So I think that's what made it a bit curious oh. for me is because, you know, for singles, obviously you have um, Fritz, Tiafo, and Paul, three great singles players. Okay. And then you have Jack Sock for the doubles, but, like, they don't even have a fifth guy. So I thought, you know, for number five, they would have had Rom, like, almost as a guarantee, but that's – but uh, – Now, I, okay. But, but there's – That's why we have you yeah. – that's why we need people like you here because, um, 
you, 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 you're, you're on the case and you've investigated it because a lot of people really haven't uh, kept up with Davis Cup. It's complicated uh, yeah. more so now than uh, it had been in the past. But it's nice to have you explain it. For our audience that we tend to focus on, on the Americas, we're, we're betting on the U.S. and Canada meeting in the semifinals. Do you have a, a feeling on uh, who would play in the other semi? Uh, the other semi, you know, it's going to be interesting because Australia is already qualified. So now they're yes. waiting the winner of Croatia and Spain. And I actually don't think this looks as good for Spain. I mean, they are playing at home, so that is obviously going to be a plus, you know, no matter what. But they're missing their two best players in Alcaraz and Nadal. <laughs> and and sure. so they're left with Pablo Carreño Busta and RBA, who are, you know, fantastic sort of litmus test players yeah. for being at the top. Uh, and they're, you know, they've had great success in team events of their own. But then you're looking at Croatia, and they've got Matic and Pavic for the doubles. Uh, you know, there's no doubting their skills. And then you've got Marin Cilic, who can still play decently well. He's number 17 oh, yeah. in the world in singles. And then you've got a resurgent Borna yeah. Choric, who's very motivated and obviously, uh, you know, one of the comeback yeah. players of this year. So, uh, yeah. you know, and I think it's going to be have a lot of pressure on, especially Pablo Carreño Busta, holding the flag. Yep. Um, and Roberto Bautista, good sort of veterans there. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if it comes down to the doubles. I, I think I'm back in Croatia. Yeah, yeah. And I, I also heard uh, a report that um, because it is in home for, for the Spanish team, they weren't happy with the court conditions. And you yeah, never like to hear fast. that. They thought it was too fast. So that's yeah, not something you want to hear um, as far as their chances, uh, right? Yeah. We had the, you know, Agassi had the same complaints, I believe, in 05 about the conditions in Carson, California. I don't know if he was upset that it was too fast or too slow, but uh, he, I would have to go back and read his comments. Um, if it's at home and your, your players are um, not thrilled about the surface, um, maybe it's nerves. Maybe it's just that's the, how they feel. That's a bad omen for me. Um, you know, I, I, and I, I don't know, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. We're, we're, neither one of us are there, but you've made it now exciting because of your analysis <laughs> and you mentioned the players that are still involved. I'm going to pay attention to it. And I think that's, what's important, um, is that, uh, you know, fans tend to, a lot of us think it's over, uh, ATP and the WTA finals ended, Billie Jean cup ended. What's left? Well, Davis Cup, uh, and, and, and you know, you know how long and grueling the season can be, and obviously we've just had the ATP Finals, and and it is Thanksgiving week here in the U.S., so I think it is quite natural for mm. you know, especially the American viewers and people on the West Coast to sort of tune out a little bit, uh, just because of maybe fatigue, burnout from the entire long season. Um, definitely, the players are feeling it because I mean, even even with this new Davis Cup format, at least last year we had Djokovic playing. The year before yeah. that, in 2019, we had Nadal and Djokovic playing. So at least we had some major star power there. And uh, but but you know this year even like Sinner is out, Alcaraz is out, Nadal has already kind of done his job once. Djokovic, uh, you know, didn't play because of yeah he played a very limited schedule this year. So uh, and it's yeah, there being injured. Uh, um, yeah. And, and and all these guys have legitimate. I mean, most of those guys, it's because of injury. Uh, you know, yeah. they, 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 it, and to your point, it is a long season. But I like how you, how you mentioned that, you know, uh, in, in the U.S., it is like Thanksgiving weekend, and that's kind of the focus is on football. Yeah. But, um, and, yeah, I mean, it tends to it's, – it's remarkable that our season basically ends the end of November and starts in the uh, end of December. I mean, it's, it's not even a full month that they have off. Hardly um, anything. And if you're, a, if you're a lot of the top players, I mean, they're also playing a lot of exhibitions in that time. I mean, mm -hmm. Nadal and Rude are on an exhibition right now in South America, and they're playing each other a bunch. And then I think mid-December is when that Abu Dhabi exhibition always pops up for about three or four days, <laughs> just out of nowhere. So, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting to see. But, like, yeah, you know, I, I, I do think it, but I, you know, I do like the year-end tournaments. I do like the time after the U.S. Open when there's that build-up towards the ATP Finals. It does sort of feel important, and I can get invested in the whole race on both tours. 
and get excited to to see it. But uh, at some point, I think we have to just take care of our players and realize that you know maybe the first week or second week of November is about where we should stop. But but you know, regardless, uh, I, I am really excited to see how this turns out, especially for the U.S. and uh, and Canada because two top ten players still in Felix and Taylor. So uh, that that's always going to keep it exciting for them. It, it's very exciting. And then obviously, look, we're tennis fans, people that um, followed uh, the podcast that you that you're on in Canada and this podcast. They're hardcore tennis fans. Um, unfortunately, the average sports fan. Uh, in Canada and in the U.S., uh, uh, you know, they depend on on a, a podcast like these to even know what's going on. It yeah. doesn't get written about. No, um, no, it doesn't get coverage. But that's that's been uh, that's not a new thing. Uh, but I would like to quickly uh, before you have to go. I know you have a match coming up later tonight yourself. Uh, we haven't talked uh, uh, touched on the women yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in championships. I had uh, high hopes for uh, Coco Goff and Pagula. Yeah. I thought, okay, these these two are gonna they did great. Uh, Pagula especially winning in Guadalajara, and man, woo, the air was out of the tires. Yeah, it's been a really long season for both of them. I mean, I I think I was charting it the other day. Pagula has played 108 matches this season, which is oh my oh my is a lot, you know. Uh, yeah. you know, and, and she's an experienced player. She's 28 years of age. She's been on this yeah. scene before. She's been thoroughly consistent this year in singles. So it was a fantastic year for her to get to so many quarters and semis and eventually win the title in Guadalajara. I was just very happy for her. Just, uh, yeah. you know, knowing the amount of, you know, just knowing how hard she works. She's, you know, basically busting her hump every single week, week after week, trying to win, sure trying to win a big title. And that was impressive for her to do in Guadalajara. And I think it just took so much out of her to then mm -hmm. come and play, um, you know, three really solid players in the in the group. She went over three, uh, but it is, I don't think it takes away the shine on her year as a whole to finish the year three in the world. And I think it was a smart move for her not to go to the Billie Jean King Cup uh, finals, even though she would have, you know, it would have given the USA a better chance there. So, but I think uh, she'll bounce back quite strong and she should have another solid year next year. But Coco Goff, I think this was the first year that she was uh, not able to play as much. Uh, she, the first year she was able to play a whole lot because of the age eligibility restrictions. Mm -hmm. And so being 18, I guess if you put it all in perspective, my stock is still high on Coco. You know, having yeah. made the French Open final and finishing the year as <laughs> seven in singles and at one point even reached number one in doubles already. So that's an incredible accomplishment at 18 years of age. And yeah, I think uh, just a lot of fatigue, a lot of nerves. Uh, you know, she was crying at one point on court just uh it was all just a bit too much and just uh you know i asked actually i asked steve flink about this that i just don't think it's sustainable maybe for coco long term as well as pagula to play mm -hmm. as much singles and doubles that they do uh, especially this year mm -hmm. because they played over 40 matches and doubles and they were one of the best players on tour so i'm interested to see what coco and her team do about her schedule next year and if they'll scale back on the doubles because obviously the priority has to be singles when you're at the level that she's at uh, having made a major final already and going deep in these tournaments. But I think she'll have a good attitude about it. She should bounce back, uh, you know, quite strong. She's got a good team in her corner. And I, I think the one area of her game that everyone talks about is still the forehand. Uh, the forehand, you know. And the serve. <laughs> and, and the second serve as well, right? Some double forehand. Yeah, the second serve. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, but but yeah, for me, I think mainly it's the forehand, just showing that side up. Right getting it a little bit more technically solid. Uh, she tends to sort of fall off to the side as she's hitting it. And it's mm -hmm. it, it's very loopy and short and spinny at, at, at times. And sometimes she can use her incredible defense and work her way back into the point. But against the very, very elite players like Ashviantek, uh, it just mm -hmm. seems to get exposed um, time and time again. So I, I, I hope, you know, they figure out a way where, because she's an incredible athlete, incredible mover. She has an awesome first serve. She has a terrific backhand and really... A, a really good attitude so that's probably the missing piece. I think, as you pointed out uh, in the beginning uh when you were speaking about her and i'm glad you brought it up you know we forget uh that you know this is the first year that she could play a full schedule because yeah. of the age eligibility restriction um so it's nice of you to uh remind our viewers of that people lose sight of that and she's been around um since she was 15 seems like longer yep and it reminds me of Justine Ennin. You know, she 
she was a player that uh, was noted for her backhand. Well, not only for its effectiveness, but it was a it was a beautiful stroke, like Gustavo Corton, like Federer, just a, a gorgeous one hander. And her forehand became better over time than her backhand. I think that boy, if we can say that about Coco Gauff, that her forehand becomes even stronger than her backhand. Then we're talking about multiple major wins, yeah, and improving that second serve. Then that that's it. That's the icing on not the icing on the cake. That's the um, the missing piece of the puzzle, don't you think? Yeah, for sure, definitely. And you know, even if it just marginally improves and just gets a little bit better by better by year, uh, she has so many other tools in her game to where as long as she is able to get the point back to neutral time and time again and. Uh, you know, on a on a slower surface like clay, I don't think it will bother her as nearly as much because she has more time on the mm -hmm. shot. She can still, uh, when she's inside the court, she can be effective with it. She's a good doubles player, so she has the skills at net to finish. And I think that's key if you don't have a you know massive weapon from the baseline, if you're able to get to the net and you know finish points. So I think she has that uh, in her toolbox as well, and she'll mature. She'll understand how to manage the schedule a little bit better year after year, and. I think this was all just a great experience for her. And, you know, so many great players go 0-3 in their first WTA finals ex uh, experience. So I don't think we should be too worried. Yeah, no, I mean, and and the veterans behind her, I mean, it's funny we call them veterans, but, you know, Madison Keys, uh, Sloane Stevens, um, what was it, uh, Kenan? She won, was it the Australian Open a few years ago? Yep, 2020 Australian Open. Yeah. And, and oh, Brady. Like there's, yeah. there's, we're not even mentioning these players, right? Tell me who I haven't brought up yet in that group behind, not behind them, but with them. Yeah. I mean, you have Danielle Collins, of course, uh, and she's, yeah, she's, her an Australian, she's an Australian open finalist. And I really miss Jennifer Brady because I remember that match in 2020 US Open. Yeah. In Sosaka. That was probably the match of the year. I mean, just stunning quality. From yeah, both sure was sweet. From start to finish. And then she backed it up the very next major by getting to the final of the Australian and she, uh, you know, she, I have, I, I remember watching her and thinking, you know, she can definitely win a major, but it's just been unfortunate with injuries for her. So, yeah. but, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, with Coco, it feels like she's been around a long time because she broke through in Wimbledon 2019, beating Venus on center court. Yeah. And since then, <laughs> since then, what I like about her rise is that it's been sort of slow, slow, but steady progression, nothing like too crazy high trajectory, but just sort of building that experience week after week, you know, just taking the losses, moving on, and just, uh, you know, just seems to get the, the tra tra trajectory always seems to be upward. So I think that's that'll bode well for her. I don't know if she'll win a major next year, but maybe in the next couple of years, she, she could have one in the bag and then, you know, maybe hopefully win many more after that. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, just, it's nice to know that she's not alone. I'm glad you mentioned Jen Brady. Like, that's a player that, um, that I, I often forget about because she's been beset by injuries. And I think Sloan, uh, I saw her in Guadalajara. I, I was hoping she was going to build on some of her early, earlier round wins. But uh, there's a cast of – there's a strong cast of characters in the, in the women's game for the U.S. Yeah. Um, so, we, you know, it, it, that, that's going to be great. Um, now, I mean, let's, let's – and I think there's – as far as the Canadian women, uh, you know, I think it's important. Like most people, uh, Bianca Andreescu, uh, it's a player that fascinates me. Yeah. I, I admire her game. I like her tenacity, you know, and she's not alone. You yeah. Know, she, yeah. She's got some good company behind her. What's your, what's your assessment of the Canadian women? Yeah, I, I, you know, just from a talent perspective, Bianca yeah. addressed you for me in 2019. That was one of the joys of the year, just to have her on, mm -hmm. just to just, just watching the entire breakout from being outside the top 100 at the start of the year, making the final in Auckland, beating Venus Williams and some great players along the way. Uh, and then the Indian Wells run that she went on was just, uh, <laughs> you know, absolutely spectacular. And then I think she hurt her shoulder as well during that time period and had to take like two or three months off. She comes back and right in her first tournament, she wins Canada. She wins, she knocks out Serena at the US Open uh, in that incredible fashion, which I'll never forget being up 5-1 in that second set. Serena pushing it back all the way to 5-all and then 
you know, being able to somehow, hand, you know, handle that occasion with such class and, you know, 23,000 people shouting Serena's name and for her to just block that out and, you, you know, just such a strength of character and like her mental resolve and resilience impressed me just as much as her. Yeah. I think we might, I, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I think no. we might have lost you on my end because um, yeah. of my internet connection. Um, I, I, my last comment was about the Indian Wells uh, match between uh, Andrescu and Kerber, where, you know, Kerber lost her mind. And I think accused Andrescu of playing like a junior. I love that match. Yeah. That's where I, we, I lost the connection with you. So they'll hopefully figure that out in uh, the edit. Yeah, I remember that spell of Indian Wells and Miami matches between Kerber and Andrescu. And, you know, I think at yeah. one point in Miami, Kerber called Andrescu a drama queen. And they had a little yeah. exchange in the net. But I, but what I remember was, uh, you know, just the, the tenacity that she had. I remember thinking this is, you know, it's quite a physical brand of tennis that she plays, obviously. But I love the combination yeah. of spins, power, variety, and just speed that she has. Mm -hmm. I thought she had one of the best return of serves and forehands in the game. And just the, the way she really stepped up on the big stage and really owned it. You know, she was, the, she was in command of the entire stadium every time she stepped on the court and it didn't matter where she played in the U S or Canada, she had most of the crowd support and she, I mean, she really brought it. Didn't matter who she played. I remember she beat yeah. a cluster of top 10 players that year. And, uh, you know, she yeah. really seemed to have I mean, that aura and fact, wow factor about her that, you know, yeah. and, and the like swagger, team. like, as you said, aura and wow factor. And I'd like to say the swagger, you know, yeah. that for a young breakout player, you don't always see, and she backed it up. And boy, that was fun. Yeah, it was I really loved fun. it. I loved it, and it wasn't like an arrogant. It wasn't in like an arrogant no. like show off kind of way. No. It was like it wasn't was arrogant. Right. It was like I believe, I believe, I belong here, and I can. Yeah, and, you know, I can, I, I, I can take over the mental and women's tennis. It was that kind of level of yeah, grit that I just love to see. And you know, she she just captivated you every time she stepped on the stage. And then, unfortunately, she injured her knee and. And yeah. in the year and, and the end of the year in China and then had to take the entire 2020 mm. off and had mental health struggles and you know but it's been nice to see her sort of slowly uh, you know work her way back this year I think she's at 45 in the world now so that's you know that's still a, some some po some positive steps in the right direction you know she beat I, I think I watched her beat Samsonova in the and in, in San Diego and I was very encouraged I you know I'm how I'm far just, did she get uh, did she get to the quarters or was it just a few wins there yeah, just a couple of wins, and then she lost to uh, Coco Goff there. But it was a tight three-set right. match, you know. So it made you believe that, you know, if she can, she can keep on building on this, she could have a big, big 2023. The key thing is just she has to stay injury-free, and she has to keep keep that belief up. I think she split with her coach. Uh, Sven Gronfeld. So that, yeah, that's she was working with Sven Gronfeld, right? And yeah, they're no yeah. longer together, is that? Yeah, yeah, the, that's true. So... I was uh, intrigued by that partnership a lot, and it seemed to be working. Yeah, that, that looks like a good one. I, he, he's had so much success throughout the years. Yeah. Um, and I was surprised to hear that uh, that they had split because they were together in Guadalajara. Um, yeah. But sometimes, well, it's complicated how, they, uh, how that works with uh, players on both yeah. tours. Um, uh, you know, I... I, I, I think in defense of somebody like Sven, who, uh, who has such a proven track record, um, it, 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 it's too complicated to say it's yeah. him or her. Sometimes it's, oh, no. there's uh, factors that we don't even know about. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's where her season ended in Mexico. And um, what about Layla Fernandez? I mean, she had a great match. She lost to Benchich in Guadalajara. Uh, yeah. Fernandez, but uh, do you think she's um, looking strong for next year? I I think so. I have to believe so. I you know I watched her at the French, and you know that's when she really started to come alive again since the U.S. Open. Yeah. Uh, obviously, she won another title this year in Monterey, so she defended her title, which is you know not very often you see that on the WTA tour. So that was encouraging. And then for her to beat uh, Bencic and Anisimova at Roland Garros. And then play through the injury in the quarterfinals against Martina Trevisan, losing a tight three-set battle there. Uh, Trevisan obviously a proven at the French Open, so uh, that was that was a, a loss that I didn't uh, 
that uh, was shocking to me because she injured herself. And when she injured herself, she took she had to take a lot of time off. And I think she was just struggling to find that form back, which is understandable. You know, you have such a massive foot injury at that age to then take like three months off and come back. It's going to take some time to build on that. So I yeah. thought it was encouraging to see. I think she played in the BJK Cup um, a couple of weeks ago and she beat Travis on 6 So when I saw that in the morning, I was like, my goodness, she just beat you at the French Open and you you know, you come back and you just double bagel her like that. So that definitely got my attention. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah. That, <laughs> that, wow. Anytime a double bagel, you throw down a double bagel, it either gets your attention for the right or wrong reasons. Right. I and, never know. And, and for her, so, you know, and she's still like 40 in the world. And yeah. people are not going to be expecting so much from her in the beginning of next year just because they're not really talking about her as much, I feel like, in the tennis landscape, just because, you know, her and Radu Kanu are sort of lumped together in that category. But I think I she's, know. She's, she's really backed it up when she's been able to be healthy this year. And, and, and her losses have been, you know, generally positive ones. They haven't been, they've come against great players. So I'm not too concerned. Yeah, like about I said, that. with Benchich, that match in Guadalajara, that could have gone either way. That yeah. was... That was, um, and the conditions were tricky. It was very windy altitude. It was uh, kind of a, it was just a tricky, goofy match. Um, and so, yeah, it's, 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 we forget how close they are to winning some of these uh, close contests. The encouraging part for both of these Canadian women is I yeah. feel like they can play on both clay and hard. And I agree. Well. Oh, yeah. And, and and that's a big plus, you know, when you're able to because that long clay court season stretch, I can bank on Andrescu having some good results. I can definitely see Fernandez in a Roland Garros quarterfinal again, and maybe even at Wimbledon with that game style, she reminds me a little bit of Kerber mm -hmm. with how easily she can take the ball on the rise, and uh, you know, and redirect pace. So there's no reason why she can't be excellent on all surfaces, and she's got so much time. She's so young. Uh, both of them are really. I mean, I f sometimes forget how young they are. So. Well, that, that that's the thing we do. We that, that that's the 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 thing that like with Coco Goff, same thing. It's like, huh? She's eighteen. Yeah. Uh, she seems like she's been here, you know, for like ten years, and it was only nineteen when she had that Wimbledon breakthrough that you mentioned against Venus Williams uh, and Fernandez and Andrescu. You're saying that if you feel they can get it done on clay, that's very encouraging. That really is encouraging. Yeah, for um, sure. And then, then I, I was about to mention, um, um, boy, I forgot her name. Jeez, uh, I, I, I mentioned her a second ago. Bouchard? Uh, she was a Wimbledon finalist. Um, yeah, e Eugenie Bouchard, right? Bouchard, yeah. I was like, wow, <laughs> brain cramp. Yeah. Bouchard, is, uh, she's, you know, that's a long way back. What's, what, are, what are you hearing about her? Yeah, I, I, I'm hearing actually that she works pretty hard uh, off court. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can come across that she's not, uh, you know, training hard for whatever reason because she does these photo shoots or because she's, uh, you know, very active on social media. But from what I've heard from all my sources, you know, she she's worked pretty hard. She's eager to get back uh, where she belongs. I think she had some really good results uh, right after the pandemic pause, getting to a WTA final. She did. Um, you know, she tends to play well in Mexico every time I see her tournament results there. Mm -hmm. And she's still competitive against some of the best players. So, you know, I, I, I still think she can get back to the top 50. And then once you get, once you're in the top 50, things are possible again. And she's still, you know, she's still 27, 28. So she's not, she's definitely still got a few years ahead of her. So she can definitely make some strides as well. Yeah, th that's important. Those are good reminders that she did have uh, a bit of resurgence in the fall. And yeah. you can make some pretty good jumps in your ranking by getting to quarterfinals. Um, yeah. You know, it can move up. I think she got into close to the top 200. I'm not sure where she ended the year. Um, yeah. But with a full commitment, you're right. There's no reason why she couldn't end up top 50. And um, what I like about her is that she showed it to us for a whole season, right? In 2014, yeah. she finished the season top five, and it wasn't just one fluky Wimbledon final result, right? She made a Australian Open semis. She made a French Open semis. Mm -hmm. Lost in three sets, a really tough match to Sharapova. That could have gone either way. And then she gets blown out by Petra Kvitova, but that's Kvitova on grass at Wimbledon. 
<laughs> in that sort of form. So I feel like uh, she can she can find that spark again. She still has time to to show her to to show what got her there in the first place. Oh, you're you're so right. She she was not. I I don't think she was a flash in the pan because she's um she had a a decent fall in the events that she was playing. Um, I guess the proof in the pudding with her will be uh, next year. Can yeah. she build on those results? How committed is she um, to just focusing 100% on the on court to the tennis? Yeah. And so, you know, that, that I'm glad that we did get to uh, mention her. The other one, um, Milos Ronich is, do we know what's the latest on him? Is he hanging it up? I, I have no intel actually on Ronich at the moment. <laughs> I have no idea where he's at in his recovery or comeback. Or uh, He's had so many different kind of injuries throughout his career. He's been one of those injury-prone type players. Similar yeah. actually to what we're seeing with, I mean, I hope this isn't the case, but I, I see some parallels between him and Berrettini. In the sense that they're oh, both, I know. God, talk about unlucky. Yeah, I, I mean, it comes from that body type, right? They're both. Good. I like. Five, that's a great comparison. Kind of, kind of a stocky chest. Uh, they yeah. both sort of great you comparison. Know, you know, both are great, terrific grass court players. They both have uh, the oh, forehand yeah. and serve as their weapon, and they they got to protect their backhands and their movement. Um, just in just in general, because it's just so hard to take care of a body like that. But Raonic, the last time I remember him playing was in 2021 when he lost to eventual champion Hubert Hercoc in Miami. And then he took a whole ton of time off and then came back for one match against Brandon Nakashima in Atlanta and lost it in yep. a third set tie break. And then I haven't seen or heard of him ever since. And I'm pretty sure he's out of the rankings, doesn't have a ranking. I'm not sure when he's planning to come back, but he's like 31 now. And, you know, he's sort of lumped mm -hmm. in that group with, you know, Nishikori and Dimitrov and, so he, he's part yeah. of that, I guess some people call it lost generation or early to mid 2010s. But yeah, I mean, if he comes back again, I mean, there's no reason why on grass he can't make some noise, but I, I, I'm not yeah. sure. I, I, I like the, the comparison to Berrettini, like the bad luck. I mean, Berrettini to me, just a little bit different than Ron. It's just even like the COVID before Wimbledon, he wins everything yeah. on grass, right? Yeah. And that, that that happens, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, finalist the year before, and he wins everything leading up to Wimbledon. Um, yeah, it, tough yeah. Time. We just that's that's a player that, oh gosh, uh, he just I just super unlucky to me. Uh, but I like the comparison with Ronis in that sense of the bad luck and the comparison, big guys and protecting the backhand or needing to. Um, but hey, I know now we're pushing uh, your court time. No and, worries, I got uh, I got another fifteen minutes, so we can keep. Oh well, that's great. Yeah. I only got another seven. <laughs> so on that note, like uh, you know, uh, from the from the Canada, the US, is there anybody we haven't talked about that either like a Rounich or somebody that's under the radar, like um, Shelton, for example, from the US, yeah. or Brandon Holt. You know, yeah. Do you expect uh, big things from either of those two Americans? Yeah, Shelton, I'm very encouraged about. I mean, he's had such a breakthrough year. He was outside the top 500 when this year started. And he's, you know, obviously we know he's a terrific Florida player and, and for the Gators. And yeah. he, uh, you know, his father played on the tour as well, just like Casper Ruud and his father. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when he first, I think it was over the summer, because he'd had some decent challenger results before, but then when he broke through and played this match against Isner in Atlanta and just lost to him very narrowly um, in a tight three-setter and then beats Casper Ruud and Lorenzo Sonigo in Cincinnati. And now you're thinking, oh my goodness, by this time next year, I mean, he could really be pushing for the top 50. I think he'll be in the top 50 by this time next year. That's sort of my prediction. But nice. his trajectory right now, I mean, he's in the top 100 and he's just won three challenger titles in a row and he won't have to qualify for the Australian Open. So that's a big... That's a big plus already, and I like his game. It, it seems to be trans transferable to the ATP Tour as well. You know, really big lefty first serve. Uh, he has big heavy ground strokes off both wings, particularly the forehand, and he seems to finish be able to finish points at net. So that's a, uh, you know, that's those are some really good skills to have, and I'm encouraged to see the how his first year on tour look 
look like. You would think there'd be some ups and downs, but um, that's another potential top 50 player by the end of next year for us Americans. I mean, yeah, to finish the year as he did, winning three, you said three challenger titles consecutively, which puts him, he, he, he's straight into Australian Open. Yeah. I mean, that's phenomenal. Yeah, it's amazing. And yeah, he, he seems like one of those, you know, once in 10, 20 years type American talents at this rate. So uh, if he can keep this trajectory up, yeah, who knows what he can do by this time next year. I mean, that is, yeah, it's pretty, that's pretty interesting. Um, and the, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, Actually, I just think that's Actually, another player, if you'll allow me to mention, uh, there's another yeah. player that's been on my mind. His name is Brandon Nakashima, also from San Diego. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched him. And, and oh, I'm familiar. Yeah, and he's, you know, born in 2001, and he's up there with the Cordas and Brooksby's of the world. And oh, he yeah. get, I don't think he gets nearly as much hype or attention as those two guys. But his results. Talk about being under the radar. Yeah, but his results week in and week out and his professionalism and his uh, and the amount of improvement that I've seen in his game the last one year makes me think that he can do something really big next year in the majors. Uh, I mean, I, I was looking at it this year. I mean, he's got a title now in San Diego, which was really big for him to win, win at home. Didn't he win the, uh, the next gen event? Yeah, and then winning the next gen finals, uh, um, taking out Jack yeah. Draper and beating you know some other talented players like Yuri Lehechka twice and just yeah, really that but I mean like that puts yeah. you in the same company as Alcaraz you know he won that I yeah. think Sinner and you and look back to those on, dudes yeah Alcaraz Sinner Sitsipas I mean they've all yeah. gone on and done I mean come on shows. they've all gone and made an Australian Open semi or won a major yeah. or won a you got that on your resume it's as good as gold because it, it's yeah. not a, I mean it's a it's essentially a pro event it's cool right yeah, you know, definitely, and and it, you know, those that scoring system with no ad and a process. Uh, I know, score, I love it. Uh, it just makes it that sudden death makes it. You you just have to be so mentally tough and calm and composed in those big moments, and that's one of his major strengths. I love his composure. Um, doesn't yes. give anything away to his opponents. He basically has a poker face um, every time he plays. Oh yeah, and I love and his it, backhand. His backhand is sweet. I mean, it's a money shot. He can hit it anywhere down the line, cross. Uh, he's got such such a good. You just look at him, and it's like such a solid base, you know, really good first serve. He's improved the forehand. I think the forehand will make or break or decide his career because he's mm. got really, uh, he's got an all round game uh, elsewhere. He's got a, he's a good mover. He can finish points at net, likes to come forward. He, he is the most under the radar dude of any country, I think, yeah. uh, on the ATP tour. I he mean, does not get talked about at all. It is like no. I mean, I, he first, he came on my radar in 2021. He beat Isner in the semis uh, down here. I live in Cabo San Lucas. Yes, and he beat Isner to get to the finals. He beat Isner in the semis to get to the finals and lost to um, Cam Nori. Yeah, in, I, I think that. like two and two. He got he, you know, yeah, you know, pretty solid defeat. But I'm like, who is this guy? And then I didn't the know he week, was the U.S. player. The very next week in Atlanta, yeah. he makes the final there and loses to Isner, but no shame in that because there you go. Out. And then loses to Isner. Yeah. yeah. So you you right? He backed up the Cabo result, um, but then it, it seemed like he went under the radar. Um, yeah. Why? I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean to be fair, well, his results the first half of this year were not, you know, were not as good. But that's because he was playing on clay also, and he got that experience. Mm -hmm. And you know, when many of the American men don't play on clay during that part of the year and they'd rather play some challengers or some other tournaments elsewhere. He put in that time and investment, knew that he wasn't going to get those results early on, but that he was building towards the future and then it would pay off maybe one or two years down the line. And lo and behold, he gets to the third round of the French, loses in three tight sets against Zverev, then makes the fourth round at Wimbledon in a very open draw and loses like in a, in a fifth set. I mean, could have gone either way, could have been up two sets to one. If he wins that, we could be talking about him as a potential Wimbledon finalist right now. So it's like, huh. you know, and then and then at the U.S. Open, he plays a tight four setter and loses to Sinner. Uh, so it's like, so you know, to have made three fourth round, three third round or betters in a row at uh, on every surface, I think he's uh, going under the radar. And by this time next year, uh, I think it's yeah. not unreasonable to expect he'll be in the top twenty-five or top thirty, and you know, have a major quarterfinal on his resume. Well, and this is what's important about um, men like yourself uh, that that uh, that chart the tennis uh, uh, 365 days a year. I can tell 
you're the kind of man that, that, that knows I can ask you about any player and you're going to rattle off these results. Uh, guys that, that a lot of us don't realize end up losing to people that win a tournament. How many guys end up losing to the dude who wins the tournament, right? Yeah. And, and that's so important that you, uh, people like you that follow the game uh, week in and week out, can fill in the gaps for most of us. Uh, and because I, I know about him from just, uh, you know, what he did in, in the city I live in. Oh, that's easy to remember. And then some results here and there. And then he, he won the next gen tournament. But you're, you're charting these guys and these women year round. Uh, that's really important, um, especially in the US where, where, we, where we live, where you live. I don't live there anymore. So thank you. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, my pleasure. I love, I love charting them. I love watching them, their rise, their development, and when I hear about them, and especially when they're playing a big match against a marquee name. From then on, I kind of take notice, and I just follow them week after week because I want to see those improvements and developments. And just from an analytical standpoint, I think it's important to know about their strengths and weaknesses, and uh, just be familiar so that it's not a big shock when all of a sudden they upset a top player, right? And everyone's like, oh, he stunned Rafael Nadal. But you actually know because you've been following for the last <laughs> year or two that, hey, this, is a, this yeah. isn't as big of an upset as you think it is, mate. So it's like, you know. Well, <laughs> well that's true. And that, <laughs> you said it perfectly. You said it perfectly. And you understand the frustrations of, of uh, those type of players that uh, they're like, hey, huh, well, <laughs> You guys haven't been paying attention to me. Um, and I think that's really important that uh, you can fill us in on that. Because I, I have a, a, a keen interest in the game. I always have. But a man like you, week in, week out, you're paying attention to both tours. Uh, that's that's of vital importance. So that's great. I mean, do you get an off season? <laughs> I, I, I try to take December and November off as much as I can. Uh, just to yeah, just to kind of maybe you follow another sport. I mean, you know, <laughs> and no other sport excites me like this one. It's it's like you know I've tried to get into several other team sports and follow a little bit of World Cup and NFL here and there, but it's it, it's not nearly the same kind of juices that get my blood flowing in the morning and waking up as this sport where it's just forty seven weeks a year. I mean, just insane drama, insane uh, you know shot making and skill all across the board. I mean, these athletes are just second to the next level. I mean, what they can do on a week and, and just mentally being able to do what they do 47 weeks a year. I have so much time and respect for anyone who's a professional tennis player just because I I can, I, I have a kind of an idea or a sense of just how tough it can be. Uh, it's just so darn competitive. Yeah, I mean, if, if a person in the world is, oh, let's say they can play the violin better than uh, 300 people in the world, in a uh, orchestra, and I'm talking about the world, they've got a full-time job. Uh, yeah. They don't have to play challenger orchestra. You know, they don't have to try out for a chair. If you're the, you know, 300th best violinist or cello player, you got a full-time gig and it's secure. And with tennis, it's not the way it is, To unfortunately. Yeah. And if you're the, you know, in other sports, if you're that good, you have teammates um, yeah. when exactly. you're having a bad week. Really good point. So, You're all by yourself. Well, yeah, but well, look now you have to get to your match, and uh, uh, you live in San Diego. Yep, that's right. Are you playing at Barnes or are you playing at uh, what's it? What's the park? Balboa. Where are you playing? No, actually, just a very local tennis court community right here, about five minutes drive from here. Uh, just playing with. Okay, a so not where they hold the pro event. School friend. Yeah, no, it's just a, it's just a regular tennis club with some basketball courts. Well, that's a cool thing. Uh, living where you live, <laughs> you don't have to play indoors. So best of luck. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. This is great. I got an education. I absolutely loved it. And I love your enthusiasm for this game and keep up this amazing podcast. Happy to come on anytime. And we'll definitely have you on. I'll definitely have you on for tennis and bagels. I am. Yeah, just for like, I'm good for about 10 minutes. Because <laughs> when there's bagels involved, then I, I tend to, I don't know, I, I like bagels more than tennis. And I've been bageled in tennis. I can talk about the bagels, but not the tennis. But if you guys will have me, I'm there, man, on a serious note. Absolutely. You got All it. All right, man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in again to 
Wild West Tense podcast. It was my pleasure to have Vanash Varmani, I hope I said that right, on the podcast this week. And don't forget to tune in uh, to your, well, actually follow us on YouTube at Quality Tennis, Quality Tennis Shot. Dot com and or where you watch your podcast or listen to your podcast. All right. Hey, thanks, buddy. Cheers. Thank you, Brad. Good night. Good night.